my name is Justin Hayward from Cambridge Investment Research uh, and I'm going to give a talk about uh, digital printing for packaging. Um, let's first uh, talk about what we're going to talk about, some key questions in packaging direct to X, trends, market structure, some of the key movers, um, market growth, uh, some evidence as to the movement of the market, um, some barriers to adoption uh, and customer drivers. And then I'll talk briefly about how to build and use the value network for your strategic logic. Cambridge Investment Research is 14 years old. We're a small independent technology consultancy doing strategy and validation, strategic logic and validation uh, based in Cambridge in the UK. Um, clients such as Domino's are ARM Plastic Logic, um, and also companies that are not relevant to today, but uh, telecoms companies, oil and gas, um, and printed electronics, and so on. Right from startups right to global multinationals. Some examples of relevant work done. We actually did the technology roadmap for ZAR back in 2003 4 for their three generations of printheads, which has since happened and, and gone past. Uh, on the events and marketing side, we've done conferences on high value manufacturing since 2002, about 36 conferences so far. And I'll mention at the end the Cambridge Graphene Festival, uh, which is taking place 5th and 6th of November in Cambridge, uh, which we'll be leading. And that takes place around the opening of a new building. And that's relevant. Graphene is a high tech material relevant to packaging. Uh, believe it or not, when you get onto the smart side of things. We've done uh, inkjet ink reports for Pyra over the years, and I've just been speaking about digital textiles next door. Uh, we did an IP strategy for Plastic Logic, which is now Flex Enable. Uh, and we've done work, as I say, on market entry strategy and digital printing for startups and spin ups in the Cambridge Tech cluster. So let me move on. Also, commercial diligence work, I should mention. One of the key ways to engage with our clients is by what we call a co-creation workshop. This can be over a day or two days in which we literally sit down with our clients, be they multinationals, be they startups in emerging markets, and we actually co-create a plan together, uh, which can then obviously be form the project that we may or may not work on together. So coming back to packaging and direct to shape and so on, um, what are the key questions for technology suppliers, packers, co-packers, and food processors? Well, obviously, what is the nature of the opportunity and threat from digital printing? How real is the interest from uh, customers in the digital packaging printing opportunity? What's the competitive landscape and market potential? How economic is digital? For the, for the packer or the processing factory, what structural changes uh, to the market and what are their effects on the business? And finally, what, probably the most important question, what implications are there for the changes in your business model? So in the longer run, uh, and I've been going to Drupa and other trade shows on digital printing since about 2004. So very young and uh, there are people that do consulting have been around for 40 or 50 years obviously but um, in my short experience these are the waves I've seen um, where we've been overestimating the short term and underestimating the long run. In 2004 Drupal was full of flatbed machines for the first time signage and displays. In 2008 it was the labels Drupal. Uh, people were doing digital labels and that was expanding rapidly. Um, in between shows, we had ceramics, and Zar, one of our clients, has been very successful in Asia, printing directly to ceramics with their new generation print heads. Um, more recently, we've had digital textiles, and obviously now at FESPA, it's, it's replete with uh, digital textiles technology suppliers. Um, but what about in the near future? Are we going to see digital printing for packaging? And I put a time scale up there, 2016, to 2018, and I wonder if that's uh, optimistic or not. Let's see. 
was a very nice um, fish diagram of the market structure for overviewing packaging and digital printing. And the thing I wanted to highlight here um, is engagement. This comes through again and again. Engagement around one-to-one -one messaging on your folding carton, on the, on the tertiary package, whatever it might be. And the reduced turnaround time, shelf visibility, you get that from digital. And correspondingly, you need a value add. So when you personalize, promote, have limited editions and so on, it enables you to charge more for the packaging to counteract perhaps the extra cost of the inks and so on. Um, I won't go through that in detail. Feel free to take uh, shots of this or look at the, uh, ask me about the presentation later. So we've recently done over 40 interviews on, uh, with the market players such as brands and retailers, technology providers and converters. And from that we were able to make a few statements about the timing of the market and where things are headed. Um, we also did a patent search um, through our colleagues and over 2,200 patents over the last 10 years, many of them much more recent, uh, which are um, evidence of activity leading to digital printing for packaging. And obviously many of the key players that you'll see here in FESPA uh, on that uh, page. But more than that, not just patents, um, these are examples of players, and I'm sorry for the code, uh, the IJ for inkjet and so on. Um, FC stands for folding carton, FP, flexible packaging, and D2, anything, is direct to. Um, many of the key players, and there's already M&A activity within that, so I believe Till being bought by Crohn's, um, having spun out of KHS, so quite a, interesting there on the direct to shape side. Um, but many different kinds of players, some of the leading players in the world. This uh, market growth comes from Pyra 2013. Global packaging, a very big market, reaching $1 trillion by 2018, according to Pyra. But what I wanted to highlight is um, where you have a slow growth in analog of 4.2% globally, um, more or less tracking GDP. The digital growth, whether it be all digital with labels and packaging, inkjet even faster, and uh, digital packaging only, is uh, you know, traveling at four to six times the speed. It's much, much faster growth. So there's tremendous potential here. And just to draw attention to these figures, very rapid growth in folding cartons and flexible packaging, uh, again from Pyra, in, within digital packaging. And we're seeing lots of activity around this and quite a lot of research. So somebody said as part of the research, packaging has gone from an afterthought to an integral part of the product. So what evidence is there for market pull? The median response in the survey of 30 was strong. Uh, well, the most common one clearly is, is strong. We have str our customers have strong interest in using digital direct packaging. And probably the, the median is somewhere between these two. and evidence of market activity um, in all those 30 or 40 players, what was the median level that they'd got to? Were they never going to touch it? Or had they already been integrating it in multiple sites? Uh, and actually, the median activity is we visited technology suppliers and we've taken samples. So it shows, shows an interest in it. And many people in the green here, we may buy within two years. And there seems to be a surge in beta installation since then, in Q4 of last year and Q1 of this year. Perceived barriers to adoption, um, I think it's a very important slide, and it's cost and low migration of inks that come top with uh, the speed that you're able to print so that whether you can put it in line with your uh, print process, or your packaging processing operation. These are the highest ones. Actually, ink drying time is related to no low migration. Interestingly, skills changes. What do you need your teams on the factory floor to do? That's not, not seen as a huge barrier. Um, but within four years, these barriers are supposed to be 
um, blown away by the technological and process developments and service design developments. So beyond that, any take-up issues would be um, due to operational inertia and organizational inertia. Um, a slide about customer drivers. Um, I suppose the punchline of this slide, just to cut to it, is that you need to work with not just the marketing department, but also the production managers team and the regulatory and ICT team, people that can handle databases and SQL, people that can handle the artwork and so on, uh, and people that can actually make this go in line in your process. So again, consumer engagement, as I said before, top of the list, but also this short, profitable, short run, um, fast turnaround segment, very important. And this is driving to shorter runs, limited edition and local events. And then the green regionalization, seasonal information languages, um, it's all about variable data effectively, which comes into the ICT and logistics guys, uh, regulatory guys. So work with all three as a decision-making unit. Um, I want to just come on to the use of value network and value network dynamics um, within your development of your strategy. Um, so how do you do a value network analysis? This is something that um, my team is very strong on within Cambridge Investment Research. Um, you need to identify all the participants, so that's the nodes in the network. And then we look at what are the expectations of each node from any other nodes in the network. So these are the flow links that you, you see, and they're directional. They can be tangible, so money flows, products. Uh, they can be intangible, such as introductions or knowledge, knowledge flow. Um, then define the overall universe of the market. And you validate participants' expectations and sequencing, so there's a logic to it. And you can look at, in an impact assessment, what is the propensity to change of those various stakeholders. If I now put up a... Um, we were working with some people in graphene, some experts, and we looked at... This is a much simpler than the next few slides that I'll show on director pack. But you bring in uh, governments. The orange are... You can't read it, but the orange are industrial players of various kinds. Uh, there are taxpayers, governments, regulatory bodies, and academics. And this uh, two couple of workshops that we had, and another one we're going to do in November to take that forward, is looking at what are the barriers to adoption and use of graphene in whichever industry it is. It can be aerospace, defense, packaging, uh, electronics, and so on. That was a, a, a somewhat simpler top-level helicopter view. And we've since, um, if I go on a slide, this was actually, and again, you can't read it because I've had, I've had to hide the, um, the details, but this was the uh, introduction of digital printing as the new technology to precisely the topic that we're looking at in this presentation of um, direct-to-pack printing. By doing this, what we're looking at is the future money flow. So we have a, we have a, a current set of money flows, and again, you need experts in the room to understand how to uh, label the various nodes. But then you can make forecasts with your group of experts in the innovation team as to, in this case, where are the very high money flows in the future? Um, green and red is very high. So you can look at various measures on the network to see who are the most influential players, who are the most connected players, um, and to what extent are particular nodes likely to be very important. So we have things like food integrators, e-retailers, um, small independent retailers, and then discount supermarkets. These players um, may well become very much more important. And also players like co-packers who can buy in digital printing equipment and actually uh, do printing in line um, and enable printing and packing at the same time, um, as, as the brand owners can do in their own factories. So there will be big changes, um, and understanding the value network in that is, is very important. Um, I mentioned the measures. We run this in a software package, um, and there are various measures 
eigenvector centrality between the centrality and so on is the number of links um, and the way that particular players are linked together and from that you can look instead of looking at all 50 nodes on the network you can zoom in on what is the influence to you where you are in the supply chain whatever kind of business you are and then obviously with a limited budget you can actually have a strategic logic based around what you're doing which is which is rationally developed and which doesn't miss uh, anything another aspect is you know the whole era of cold calls and traditional marketing is going away as we change towards sort of engagement and learning which lends itself to social media if this this kind of analysis really enables you to do that social media the inbound marketing all that stuff really well and uh, again that's something that I'm happy to talk to anyone about should they be interested so um, in addition to strategic logic you need validation that comes back to the traditional um, market research and actually testing statements which uh, is around business intelligence and again you can use social media to do that but you need to validate your strategic strategic logic and it turns out that um, I mean we use confidence levels in our impact assessments and opportunity prioritizations and so on if you don't put probability into your analysis and then see how you can do research to increase your confidence then you're not doing it uh, in a very sophisticated way uncertainty in this is a paper out of the University of Toulouse uncertainty turns out to be the best predictor of outcomes and that's why we we track confidence um, this is roots to value which again is a, a trademarked approach that we have to strategy and a lot of companies they'll write down the times and then they'll stick down in a load of squares what are our projects and that's our timeline that's how we're, that's how we're going to do our strategy but how does this on its own connect up with what you're about your goals the values of the, the organization your purpose have you actually bothered to write down an objective we're going to be the top 10 in the top 10 b2b brands by 2020 um, 30 percent of our business is going to be digital by 2017 something like that um, it takes a you know often it takes the CMO that's been given a free Libra role to actually go out and on a walk he'll come up with that or he or she will come up with that um, target you can also sit down and do a workshop and actually get these objectives in and then there are sub objectives that lead you in that direction and there are tactical actions changes and these projects which come from here which everybody does well these then are bolted on to take us towards the end goal and we put in confidences uh, into that strategic logic so that, that's what I mean by strategic logic very few people actually do this so yeah we offer methods uh, validation hands-on with the business intelligence and obviously for some people it, independent review that comes down under um, commercial diligence so I mentioned the activities within validation and routes to value so just to say this again the routes to value view explicitly links planning with execution and it allow, allows for the impact of any decision to be understood and for those of you interested in graph theory it's a directed graph everything aligns to a strategic goal and there it is again that's the just the generic diagram that within the early workshops we can actually produce with each company confidence tables again this is pretty obvious stuff but many people don't use confidence tables write down the probabilities um, and, and you know have a workshop where you label what that is and you can you can then apply that to your strategic logic if we're right up here and higher you know five percent is a wild guess no credibility and the idea is you use the validation to increase the probability until you get past the stage gate the top brass in the company say right okay we can go with this because we've taken the our knowledge of what's going on is sufficiently high to go to the next stage and we go ahead um, so I, I'd like to stop there but just to say we are offering master classes um, in a range of horizontals and verticals one of them is going to be strategic logic as I say axiom mode and for service design within digital printing 
uh, and this is the structure of it. You will have a two-day workshop, a follow-up after three months, and then optionally getting into consulting. We have a team of four people offering these masterclasses. And finally, um, as I mentioned, there is, a, there is a link between packaging and graphene. We've been running the graphene conferences in Cambridge and Oxford over the last couple of years. There's a brand new um, building for graphene with clean rooms and labs, which is just being completed in Cambridge as we speak. And we're having a festival uh, on the 5th and 6th of November uh, in Cambridge with a dinner at King's College, um, with a masterclass, and with a full day of business uh, talks. The vice chancellor of the university, uh, the head of the graphene flagship, uh, Professor Andrea Ferrari. So um, I'll stop there, but thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please do uh, ask them now or, or, or separately. I can link in with you uh, and send you the slides if you like. Thank you very much.